The first question we ask in a pitch in politics is, how are we targeting your voters, right? It's not, and this kind of goes back to what we talked about earlier, which is we think in, in businesses, we're, we're asking about the customer first. How do we target the customer? What is the customer like? What are the voters like? So we try to understand more than anything what the voters want in their politician. You're listening to Author Hour, enlightening conversations about books with the authors who wrote them. I'm Charlie Hone. Today's episode is with Philip Stutz, author of Fire Them Now. Is your digital marketing firm failing your business? If you want to get better results, there's no better place to learn than the strategies used in the fast-paced arena of political marketing. In this episode, Philip points out the common failures in the digital marketing industry and how the strategies and tactics used in politics can be used to win for business. And Philip knows this really well. He has more than 20 years of political and business marketing experience. He's contributed to more than a thousand election victories of senators, governors, representatives, and two US presidents. And now Phil's digital marketing firm helps politicians and small businesses and multiple Fortune 200 companies. And they've won more than 20 honors, including the award for digital video excellence in a presidential campaign. Phil has been referred to as a political guru by ESPN and a marketing genius on Fox Business. And in this episode, we're going to talk about why political marketers are producing some of the most successful marketing in the game. They work with limited budgets and super tight deadlines, and yet they're very successful and proactive. And by the end of this episode, you're going to have a better way for your business to succeed in the changing economy. And stick with us through the story at the beginning, which is a bit longer than most episodes, because it ties in with one of the most important lessons of this podcast. And now, here is our conversation with Philip Stutz. It really starts by probably back in 2012. And I was diagnosed with an incurable esophageal disease. Basically, the nerves and the muscles in my stomach do not work. And when you eat, you know, the nerves and the muscles push your food down into your stomach and mine don't. Uh, And they'll never do it the rest of my life. That is, I mean, it's done. It's I have a dead esophagus, basically. And for the first five years under that disease or four and a half years, I had three major surgeries. They've shredded my esophagus. I've had 15 minor procedures. I am on a path in the next 10 to 15 years of having my esophagus removed and being on a feeding tube the rest of my life. And for the first five years, that disease until about a year ago or even a year and a half ago, I did what most everybody does, which is I went to the doctors. I was at Hopkins, Johns Hopkins and at the Mayo Clinic. And they said, you have this disease. There's nothing you can do. Here's your medication. See you in six months. And I didn't want to face my prospects. And I didn't do any research on the disease. I just took my medicine, listened to my doctors and went home. And I kept basically eating the same foods that were what I have now determined caused the disease. And so- Which foods? Well, I'll let me, I'll get in that in one second. Sure. So the bottom line was that I, over time, became depressed over the fact that I was in a pretty dire situation. That ended up bleeding into my marriage- It bled into my parenting for my little girl, and I really became just a genuinely not nice person, selfish, you could even say narcissistic in a way. I was going down a pretty pretty rough path. And then slowly but surely over time, I just decided I didn't want to live my life that way. And the funny thing is, is that the first things I changed were I created basically a startup company, a digital media marketing company in politics. And 
didn't address my family issues or my health. And the company exploded. We went from two employees to 20 employees. We went from basically less than a million in revenue to we're now at eight figures. And we did this. We started the company in 2015. And over that three-year period where we were doing this company, I started to address my personal issues, approached my wife and told her that uh, I understood that I was a problem (laughs) and I needed to change who I was. And I fundamentally had a lot of flaws that caused a lot of problems and a heartache and and with her. And I was the problem. She wasn't the problem. I'd always put it on her. And the fact is it was me. Facing that really sucked, but I really don't have any other motor in me than growth. And so I decided if I was going to grow, I had to change my wiring at the young age of 39, 40 years old when I've been wired one way my whole life. And so I started working on that and I've made a ton of progress. And same thing in my parenting. My daughter now is everything to me. She is my whole life. And I don't know if I always felt that way. So I I was really in a bad place. I I probably attribute this not only to the way I was raised or wired, but also just in the disease. It probably was put it on steroids a little bit. The last thing was... In August of 2016, I went to the Mayo Clinic and my doctor for a review after my third surgery. And the doctor basically said to me, Philip, you know, the surgery was successful. The two previous ones were not. They were fail- they failed. And he said, this one worked, but you know, you can only have, this is basically what they did. They cut quarter of my stomach out, wrapped my stomach around my esophagus, and then shredded my esophagus so food would dump into my stomach. And, they, and then they stapled it all together. So I mean, I'm a I'm a mess inside wow. right now. Yeah. And uh, can I cuss? Yeah. All right. So I'm a I'm a fucking mess, right? <laughs> right. And uh, you know, he said the staples will come undone one day. It could be in a year, it could be in 10 years, we just don't know. You possibly can do this surgery one more time, but that's it. And they basically, if you looked at me in my stomach, it looks like I've been in a knife fight. I mean, they I just got scars all over the place from where they went in to do the surgery. And he, and I said, "Well, what happens after the second surgery or this, you know, if I have to do the surgery again. And they said, oh, you'll, you'll have a, we'll remove your esophagus and you'll have a feeding tube the rest of your life. I'm 43. Like I'm thinking, I'm thinking, wait, I'm going to be in my fifties and I've got to have a feeding tube the rest of my life. And they're like, yeah. And I went, well, I can't just eat the way I've always eaten. Take your medicines that you're recommending. You know, they not only recommended high doses of antacids, which have long-term dementia effects, they also recommended opioids for pain and all that stuff. And I just went, I'm not doing that anymore. I've got to get a hold of this. So I spent six months putting everything in my power, everything I knew what to do into understanding the disease itself, not taking action, understanding it. I took thousands of tests from food allergy tests to blood tests. I I took poop tests. I took urine tests, blood tests. I took everything. And what we determined was that I had an unbelievable, horribly unhealthy gut. My Hmm. gut health was in terrible shape. You're looking at me right now, Charlie. I am skinny. I've worked out five days a week for the last 20 years of my life. And I thought I ate healthy. And I didn't know, I didn't understand what was going on. One of the, as an example, one of the foods is dairy. Like I am incredibly intolerant to dairy. And I ate cheese, milk, some kind of dairy every single day of my entire life until this test came back that said, you should not be eating dairy. Hmm. It's crazy. And would would you feel bad after you'd eaten dairy? Yeah, I, I think that's part of you the problem. You were just fine. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I mean, I guess. I don't, I don't know what feeling bad was. It just right. felt normal to me. Yeah. So once we understood, there's, there's two things that I've, I'm fighting, which is how do I preserve my health? So I don't have to have another surgery and my esophagus stays intact. And then obviously it's, you know, I have this disease and can my, can we ever figure out what to do with my esophagus? So that was the first six months. And then, and uh, a year ago, I went to a conference in Los Angeles called the Abundance 360 Conference hosted by Peter Diamandis, P- Peter right? Diamandis and who's now become a friend. And he got on stage and he talked about m- taking a moonshot. Everybody in their life should be taking moonshots. And I went to the conference and I thought I was going to be, I was working on my business. It was, it's a business conference and that's what I thought I was going to work on. And it hit me like a bullseye in the head that I needed my moonshot to be my disease. And so I decided, I wrote it in my notebook, I will cure, I will find a way to get this disease cured in five years. And again, Which previously to everyone had told you incurable. It is, is incurable. Yeah. No one's ever been cured of this. Yeah. Ever. It, 
and it's rare. And the, the why I tell you that is what it's like one out of a hundred thousand, but most of the people that have it are in their seventies and eighties. So my age, it's probably one out of you know, millions. And the reason I say that is there's no money in rare diseases. Nope. No nope. one's looking for a cure. No one's trying to find a cure. Yep. It's, it's, I'm out there on the ledge. And so as part of this transformation of my psychology, both in the way I led my business, became a, a father and, and a husband, I decided to take control of my disease. And so you're asking me what this book is about. I'm getting to it. <laughs> but the bottom line is I created this moonshot. And over the last 12 months, I wrote an article in Inc. Magazine a year ago. It got picked up. Someone saw it. That's a researcher on this disease reached out to me, said that my moonshot was idiotic, but she would call some doctors, found this one doctor at Johns Hopkins. I was treated at Hopkins and had failed surgeries at Hopkins. This doctor had never been introduced to me. He had been working on this disease for 20 years and she put me in touch with him and I told him I was going to cure, I wanted to find a cure to the disease. And he said, well, I'm working on a cure for this disease. And I said, I believe stem cells could probably cure this disease. That, By the way, I'm not a doctor. I just made that up. <laughs> and he said, I believe stem cells actually can be the cure to this really? disease. So we started, the, we put a team around me and we started working on it. And I had a call with the doctor last week and we're almost approved by the FDA and we're going to create a one man clinical trial. I'll be the guy. It's never been done before. It's not been done on animals. There is a, they will extract stem cells out of my calf. They will culture them, grow them. And then in the fall of 2018, they will begin a clinical trial where they will inject stem cells into my esophagus to see if it will regenerate the nerves and the muscle. And the reason that that long story is being told is that I started at a depressed place. I started at a place where I didn't lead my life the right way. And I changed my mind. I changed my mindset. And because of that, I'm on the precipice of a clinical trial. If that trial succeeds, holy cow, that's amazing. If that trial fails, I'll figure out plan B. I mean, it doesn't really bother me. Ultimately, this disease is a blessing. It changed my life for the better. It improved my life in so many ways. I wouldn't take it back. And frankly, if you gave me the chance to go back and not have it, I would take it still. And why that relates to this book that I wrote called Fire Them Now, The Seven Lies Digital Marketers Sell, is that in a parallel universe over the last three years that I created my startup company, I kept seeing CEOs of businesses very frustrated in the digital marketing space. They kept hiring digital marketing agencies to, to help market their businesses that in the past, they could market their business by running TV ads and radio ads. It was a straight shot. Hey, let's buy a TV ad. Ooh, look, people are coming in the door. There's this huge ROI. This is easy. And the digital marketing space is not that way. And these owners of these businesses were so confused and pissed and frustrated. And they'd fired one digital agency and then they hired another one. They fired another one. And I'm in the political marketing space. And I go, well, why did that digital marketing firm do this and this and this? And I just started seeing that on the business side, digital marketing agencies were stealing from the people that they had, that had hired them. They were being fraudulent to the people that were hiring them. And I found that the principles that we were employing in politics were the honest and truthful way for them, for these businesses to succeed. And in a way, these business owners were sticking their head in the sand in much the same way I did for my disease and in my own life for a long time. And it resonated with me. I like felt empathy. I understood their pain because these business owners, their business is their life. They built something. They own it. It is something that's very valuable and important to them. And it was they're losing market share. This disruptive economy that's going on right now, it's freaking everybody out. And they're trying to get ahead of the game, but they're not doing anything because they don't understand the market space, the digital marketing space for their own business. And so I decided to shed a light on that and tell the lies that the digital marketers are out there selling businesses and then lay out a lot of stories on businesses that are doing the right things and how political principles can actually grow a business and grow their market share. And, and I lay out tons of examples of how businesses have used political principles to grow. And that was the impetus of the book. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot to, I mean, thank you for sharing that. First of all, I, I can't tell you how like personally inspiring that is that you took that mentality because I've, I've seen 
family members of mine be sentenced basically sure. to incurable diseases and had the initial reaction that you had, right? Of just burying your head in the sand or just this is the way it is. And I get that, but it's also so frustrating and sad. So it's, it's great that you took the growth mindset of... And I would even tell you this. I mean, this is just a month ago. You can hear me now. You can understand my passion. You can see that I a, have a growth mindset and all that stuff. But even a month ago, I mean, my wife sat down and says, you're still being held back. And, and I go, how? And she says, you just, there's a certain amount of fear still in you. And I went, man, that is so intuitive. Like, it really is. How did she pick that up? Well, we bought some property and we want to build a house. And I was like, I don't know if we have the money. And she's like, well, if you changed your mindset and said, I'm going to figure it out, instead of saying how we can't do it, let's figure out how we can do it. And I went, yep. And frankly, the thing that will hold anybody back is fear. And so, literally, this is four weeks ago, I just said, that's it. Fear will never grip my life again. It's already, I've already relinquished about 80% of it, right? But there's this 20% that's still holding me back a little bit. And so, I just decided a month ago, I'm giving up that 20%. I'm done with it. it I don't want to live that way anymore. And I don't want to see businesses live in fear. When we talk about the disruptive economy, look, I'm going to, you, we're in Austin right now. We're in the hub of tech and everything. And we're in a building where I just saw, you know, Uber is, is in this building that we're in right now. And we talk about automated cars, right? People in the tech industry la will laugh out loud at automated cars. Like that's a done deal. It's happening, right? My five-year-old daughter will never drive a car. Mm -hmm. That will never happen. It's not about automated cars and it's not about truck drivers are the first people to be disrupted. It's about the second and third order consequences of that just one disruption in an economy that will have thousands upon thousands of disruptions. And the example I talk about is and in the book is, look, if you work in the emergency rooms of hospitals and all of a sudden we have automated cars that are 99 percent safer, what does that do to emergency room nurses? Mm. How many will be cut when governments can't collect speeding tickets anymore? How does that affect revenue, tax revenue? And where do we get the revenue to make that up? And who has to be taxed? And, if, you know, and then the biggest impact of all, I think, is organ donations. When you have, mm. last year, wow. we had yeah. 38,000 people die in car accidents in America, millions worldwide. Yeah, What happens to those people on organ donor lists when those people that passed away in a car accident and their when their organs aren't available anymore, they got to go to the three D printers. That's right. <laughs> no, that's absolutely yeah. right. There's a guy named Tony Atala at Wake Forest University. Go look him up on YouTube. He gave a TED talk on this exact. Thing. He's he's literally three D printing organs. Yeah, but is that, is that your plan B? By the way, for yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. In yeah, fact, yeah. Tony Atala is on my team. There you go. Uh, so uh, I, I have an insane peep group around me. I, right now. Yeah, no. So kidding. it's really cool. But all that all started with one moonshot yeah. and a notebook that I wrote down and putting yourself out there and making. And yes. Make, yeah. And in a way, God, this sounds crass, and I'll admit it is. I marketed my disease, and guess what? That's fair. Look yeah. where I am right now. Right. And so you can say that's uh, misleading or not genuine, and and I will admit there are probably certain elements when you put yourself out there. I wrote a ten part series and medium on it, and about the whole process, and it's fair. But at the same time, the result is that I'm on the cusp of a, of a clinical trial, and I have a team of doctors, world renowned doctors around me right now. And that all happened because I created a moonshot. Yeah, and it created a conversation with people in the medical industry. Sure. That normally they probably wouldn't be exposed to or feel the impetus to jump on that. That's right. Yeah. Well, let's talk about your book. <laughs> okay, let's so do it. So I've got experience in digital marketing. Sure. I have seen the types of marketers you're talking about. I've probably been the type of marketer <laughs> that you're talking about. You're a liar. <laughs> right. So talk to me about the marketer's lies. And it's funny, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day and he said, if I could write a book, I would write marketing as a fraud. So tell me the lies that can expose the game. Marketing isn't a fraud. 
honest marketing works. I've taught that, listen, if I told you all seven, we'd be here for six hours because there's so much context behind it. And that's why you have to read the book to understand the context. And then we lay out the political principles behind the, why the, why it's a lie and how it can be uh, overcome. But I'll, I'll give one example. I, I call it, it's uh, the lie is, you know, oh my God, your product is amazing. I cannot <laughs> wait to market your product. And that sounds like, how is that a lie? Well, it's a lie because what digital marketers do is they stroke the ego of an owner and they tell them that their product is amazing and the product may not be amazing to the customers. How do you know? But in the pitches, these marketers will say, oh my gosh, this is the coolest product I've ever seen. Your customers love it. We're going to market this. We're going to make, uh, you know what? You're going to sell out for a million dollars, a hundred million dollars, whatever. And the, that's a lie. It's all to stroke an ego of an owner who's very proud of their product or business. And what it does is it doesn't put the priority of trying to grow the business first. What it does is it helps the marketer get the contract. And another lie is that part of the, of the book, which is every digital marketer on the corporate side that I've interviewed or every CEO I've interviewed has told me the same thing is that, look, in politics, we have contracts that go month to month. I've never signed a contract in 22 years of being in politics where our contract didn't have a one, any client of ours could get out of the contract when a two to two week to four week notice, which forces us to innovate constantly because we're fighting for our jobs every single day. On the other hand, digital marketers in the corporate space get six month contracts, 12 month contracts, 18 month contracts. If they fail, if they succeed, whatever, they're going to get paid first. They're, they got the guaranteed contract. In fact, a buddy of mine is a venture capitalist out in Silicon Valley. They needed a start. One of their startups needed a digital marketing plan. They were, they, they hired this digital marketing agency out of San Francisco and the agency made this VC sign a signing, made them pay them a signing bonus before they started of $75,000. Yes. Before they got the work, they even started the work. The six months into the 18 month unbreakable contract that this guy signed, everything was failing. Like the marketing plan had not worked. They had spent way too much money and it was a total bust. And they still had to pay the marketing firm for 12 more months before they could get out of the contract. Another lie that I talk about, it goes kind of complimentary to that story is in politics, we're the ultimate startup. We start with a candidate that has no name, no brand, and no money. And over a nine to 15 month period, we have to raise millions of dollars, spend it all, and try to get that person elected. What that does is it forces a couple of things. When we don't have money early in the campaign, we have to test every concept possible with very little amount of money. So on the digital marketing front, you'll appreciate this, like, you know, I try to tell business owners this. Look, we want to test 10 concepts. We, we know two or three will work. We know seven will probably not work. But before you spend a lot of money, let's do a small spending plan and let's test all these concepts. Let's do a three-month probationary period so we can earn your trust, show you what works. You're not out a lot of money and we'll figure out where the ROI is for these ads. And just curious, how much do you typically a lot to spend for a everybody test. is different but i mean you know it could be a thousand dollars a month to ten thousand dollars a month it depends on how big you know we have a we have small business clients but we also have fortune 200 clients so sure. yeah. it just depends on theirs yep but for a fortune 200 ten thousand dollars a month is unbelievably small like yeah, that it's, is it's nothing. nothing it's uh, yeah but what it does is it earns the trust and it shows the company we're putting their needs above ours that we're going to find out what works before we spend all their money and what corporate marketers do as they go they test too all of them test that's not a lie they'll go look we want to test these concepts but we need 100 grand a month or we need 200 grand a month or if it's a small business they'll say we need 20 grand a month and we're going to do all this testing and then they come back and they say okay we've spent you know for a small business we've spent 60 grand of your money now we know it works 
and let's get into the real budget and we need another 250. So again, they're getting paid before any success. My whole principle or the whole concept of the book is to say, no, it's your business. You need to figure out what works. You, the, the marketer should put your needs above their needs. In politics, if a candidate loses, we lose. And what I mean by that is our business is a hundred percent reputational and referral. I cannot advertise my marketing company. It would be laughed out of the industry. Every expenditure I make in politics goes on a publicly viewable website, either the Federal Election Commission or some state-based website. Every competitor of mine knows who I work for and how much I'm spending on a particular campaign. And they will cut my legs out from under me. They'll gut me if I lose a race. They will crush me in any pitch. So my focus is on winning. It is on the client. And when the client wins, then I get to run around and brag about how great we were and we get to make money. But And we get win bonuses, not signing bonuses. But my point is like you're forced to automatically think of the client. And then if you, if you understand that concept, then you understand how fast we have to move in a nine to 15 month period from zero dollars to millions to raise money, to spend money, to test concepts, to figure out what works, to get out votes, to win. It's for us. And in writing this book, we really understood the concept was winning. And people don't talk about winning in business. They talk about market share and they talk about what's the ROI. <laughs> and uh, can we get a 10% gain? And they do it in their ER voice. Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> dude, like it is about winning in politics. You win or you're, or you die. You're out of business. And in 2016, our marketing firm, we had 120 races we worked on, including the presidential campaign. We won 92 out of 120 races. I still failed. I still had races that didn't win. That's the honest truth. But we won a lot more than we did, than we lost. And because of that, we've, you know, doubled the company basically every year we've, we've been in business. And I don't think I would have done that had I not had so much accountability in the fact that we have election day and the fact that we have a, a transparency and all of these things are lacking in the corporate marketing space. And so when I started thinking about this, man, I went, oh my God, like these are incredible concepts. Why aren't businesses doing that? Yeah. I was just thinking like for digital marketing agencies, how could they implement that into the way that they do business? Like, how could they lead with that? And I take it this book is not to teach digital marketing right. agencies how to do better work and be more transparent and accountable. But do you have any advice for them, for those who want to be better? And Well, think, think about this. We are in an in a customer-centric economy. Like when we talked about the disruption a little while ago, everything is coming down to the customer. The customer is in charge now. I mean, if you go buy a car these days, the dealership no longer is in charge, right? The customer is in charge. If you go to a restaurant, the restaurant can't treat you bad anymore because there's Yelp. The customer is in charge. If you get into an Uber or a Lyft, the customer rates the drivers. Well, the drivers can rate the customers now, but we're really a customer centric economy. And that is going to be, it, it is, that is where we're going on steroids. And we're, we're not even, we're not even 10% there. And so, marketing agencies on the corporate side that understand this and provide transparency and go, you know, one of the things we've done on our corporate marketing side is we say to any business, come work with us. We'll give you for the first three months, no contract. And we'll do these small testing projects. And after that, if you're satisfied with us, let's figure out how we can work together. And by the way, it'll still be a month to month contract after that. So you basically can get out anytime, but we, you have to prove it to the client to the business owner every single day. And the reason my political business took off so fast is I think I understood that concept maybe subconsciously when we started the company three years ago. And the reason we picked up corporate clients is because I get this. That is where the world is going. Yeah. And I built a customer client centric company that only succeeds if they succeed. Author Hour is sponsored by Book in a Box. For anyone who has a great idea for a book, but doesn't have the time or patience to sit down and type it out, 
Book in a Box has created a new way to help you painlessly publish your book. Instead of sitting at a computer and typing for a year, hoping everything works out, Book in a Box takes you through a structured interview process that gets your ideas out of your head and into a book in just a few months. To learn more, head over to bookinabox.com and fill out the form at the bottom of the page. Don't let another year go by where you put off writing your book. How often do you hear from your corporate clients, new corporate clients, we haven't seen an agency interact with us this way at all? Every single <laughs> yeah, one. That's what I figure. Every yeah, single yeah. one. Now, we've made mistakes. We we took some clients that were, had fired so many firms that we came in and we laid out three months. Just another firm. And they, yeah. yeah, they said just another firm. And then, you know, they didn't pay us and... Like for the for the actual ad buying that we did for them, and then all of a sudden you went, all right, well it's a two way street. Like if I'm going to be transparent and I'm going to be ethical, you have to be. So then we actually fired a couple of our corporate clients because I said, you know what, it's a two way street. These guys need to be on the same page as as us. They need to go fast. They need to be strategic and smart, and they need to understand our ethics and our transparency. And we all need to be on the same page. And if we're not, it's just not going to work. One of the things that I did, and it's at the end of the book, and if you go to philipstutz.com backslash audit, I I wanted to provide value to business owners. And so we spent, while I was writing the book, we spent three months creating, uh, and it's a, a marketing audit for any business owner out there, anybody listening to this, you basically go to that website, you fill out all your publicly listed, you know, your website, your social media, your digital presence. My team will spend, you know, a week or two going through all of your information publicly available and we don't share it. It's very private. We, you, you can, you know, you'll see the agreements we have on there. the, The audit will literally take five minutes. We made it quick. We made it fast. And then we will spend, uh, we will monitor and audit your company's marketing and press going to look it up. And then what we will do is we will grade you and we'll put together a scorecard and we'll tell your business if you're being taken advantage of. We'll tell your business if you're doing the wrong things on social media. So you can take that back to their market, the marketing firm and, and short sort of, you know, expose their lies. If your marketing firm is actually doing a great job, we'll tell you that too. We'll give you a great score. We will also tell you if you, we think you're overspending or underspending. And we will put that all together for you complimentary. We just, we want to, I wanted to provide value. And in addition to the fact that this was something I identified that no one was writing about, I wanted to go one step further. And I said, why don't we create a complimentary audit? This is an audit that we have charged clients in the past $5,000. We will do it complimentary and you don't need to hire us. If you get done with the audit and you're impressed and you want to hire us, that's great. We can talk about that. We have to be aligned in order to work together. Sure. But uh, I wanted to provide value to the reader uh, in a way that I didn't think anybody else was. Yeah. I'm looking at the form now. It should only take a minute or two to really fill this out. And is is there a minimum? Th- did you say there's a minimum threshold of a type of company that you like to work with? Of, uh, of no, what they not, like to spend? No, I mean, you know, or? it just depends on the needs of the, of the client. You know, there are businesses that do a half a million dollars a year that want to create really cool videos for their company. Well, we have a full service digital Uh, our full service production, video production team. We shoot ads, we produce ads. Our ads were, you know, uh, last year we were awarded the best digital video in a presidential campaign. And yeah, we've done, uh, we, on the corporate side, we've done beer ads, we've done car ads, we've done a bunch of different things. So we have an incredible creative team. Yeah. And, uh, it's a lot of fun. But you look, some of those smaller companies can't do big campaigns. So we create, we do creative work for them. I want to serve. My only, the only thing I ask in return is that we're aligned. For sure. So that's philipstutz.com slash audit. Philip with two L's. Yep. Stutz with two T's. That's right. Cool. S-T-U-T-T-S. Excellent. So let's talk about winning. How do you guys actually go about winning? What is the most effective thing? If you had to pick one of the, of the strategies that you consistently employ in these political campaigns that companies can apply. 
What would you pick? I would look at the, there's a chapter, I think your number one priority. It's basically how we target in politics. Everything comes down. Like the first question we ask in a pitch in politics is how are we targeting your voters? Right. It's not, and this kind of goes back to what we talked about earlier, which is we think in, in business sense, we're, we're asking about the customer first. How do we target the customer? What is the customer like? What are the voters like? So we try to understand more than anything what the voters are, want in their politician. And it doesn't mean that I go to a politician and I say, all right, you have to believe in these things because this is what the voters want. But I'll tell you this. If, if This is a hot topic right now. If I have a, a candidate that is running and he is a pro-gun, pro-Second Amendment, and he's running in a district or a state that's anti-Second Amendment, like wants gun control, I'm not going to tell him he should change his position. I'm just going to tell him, don't talk about that issue. T- speak to these three issues that you are aligned with your voters and make that the core focus of your campaign campaign. And then, so we figure that out. And what we do is we, fi- we do a lot of research and then we have an extraordinary amount of data in this world today. Data really is the driver of everything we do. And in politics, every single state has a voter file. And the voter file is, you know, if you are registered to vote, I know your name, I know how many times you voted. I know if you vote in primary or general election. I know your age. I know whether you're married. I know whether you've got kids. I know everything basically about you. And this is before I get into consumer data. This is just voter data. Yeah. And I know this in every single state. And in most states, I know whether you're Republican, Democrat, Independent, unregistered. I know everything. And so if you are, and so you got to understand, think about it this in business terms. If we're so precise in that front, that's how we approach sort of customers and clients when we're doing campaigns on the business side. I know a voter, if you vote in primaries, that's a habitual voter. And boy, you're going to get a lot of messaging from me. If you are a voter that only votes in presidential election years, and it's a non-presidential election year, so we're coming up on 2018, the, the elections in November, then I, you, won't get much, you won't get many ads from me. Does that make sense? Totally. Yeah. And, it's, um, and so we, it's looking at these actions that are indicative of who is your ideal. We look ideal. at the trending. Yeah. We look at the actions. We understand. And then we do a very complicated series of research on every single voter individually. And we create pro- voter profiles of every single voter in every single state. And then we target that person with individualized messages based on what they care about and, and that candidate and where they're aligned. And that, that's a very simple explanation to a very complicated way that we do it. But that is our secret sauce. So how does that differ from maybe a digital ad agency that's focused on, hey, we have all this data on Facebook and yeah. we're going to spend 10 grand a month for you on Facebook. Is it, is it fundamentally different? Or? No, I, there are similarities, but here's what I would say the difference. We do research, tons and tons and tons of research Not every small business, I would tell you, not not any small business is doing a lot of research. And one of the things we advocate in our corporate marketing campaigns is can we do some research to figure out your customers before we spend your money? I think that's really important. I'll give you a great story. And it's a corporate story. There is a, and it's in the book, but there's a startup that came out a couple of years ago called Bodega. Do you ever hear of them? Sounds familiar. Yeah. So Bodega was, they were going to put kiosks in apartment buildings and workplaces, basically like a vending machine, but would have all the staples of anything you would have. So you don't have to go to the CVS. You don't have to go to the Dwayne Reed's or the Wal- Walgreens or whatever. And it's all in a kiosk. So if you live in an apartment building and you needed a toothbrush, you could go down to your Bodega kiosk and get that. Sounds like a pretty cool concept. Got millions of dollars in venture capital funding, millions. Some of the big dogs were putting money into this. It was such a good idea. They actually did go, went out. They did, they went out and did research and they said, well, let's research Hispanics to see if they like, if they're offended by the word bodega. And guess what they found out that Hispanics didn't give a shit. Like 96% of Hispanics said, no, we call grocery stores and corner stores bodegas, right? So they were like, great, no problem, let's go. And so they went out and they created this and they put, started putting it everywhere and they expended all this capital and they made one big flaw. And the flaw was that they didn't research every market uh, target audience. 
like we do in politics. They didn't research woke millennials who were offended for the Hispanics that the no word bodega way. was being used. They called it cultural appropriation. They were offended that how dare this company come out and 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 you know do this to Hispanics. Hispanics didn't care. And so they you're, took you're embarrassing me on they, behalf of my th- th- generation. They took to social media and they basically crushed the entire startup. It's barely in existence now compared to what it was. I lived in Washington, D.C. for 17 years. I lived in a uh, very gentrified, like, like Austin, a lot of gentrified neighborhoods. I lived in a very gentrified neighborhood. We had many bodegas in my neighborhood. And the another offending element that they didn't research was that people in cities where they were trying to put this in, in, in big metropolitan areas, they didn't realize that people like their bodegas. And if I was to, and I'm thinking about it, it makes sense. In my bodega, the bodega that we always went to in, Was- in my neighborhood in Washington, D.C., was owned by this Ethiopian family who had this incredible story how they came to this country. And I wanted to spend all my money there because I loved that family so much. I loved their story. They were hardworking. They were immigrants. They were, they, they were working, you know, 12 hours a day, seven days a week. Like, that's where I wanted to put my money, right? So, in addition to offending millennials, they didn't realize that the, they were taking... <laughs> way the jobs and the businesses of the inner of the city businesses that these they were trying to put these these kiosks now so the the company obviously didn't do their research properly they didn't look at their target market properly they targeted and researched the wrong markets and eventually it cost millions and millions of dollars and i would tell you in politics that never would have happened wow that's nuts and again i am embarrassed on behalf of woke millennials, uh, <laughs> man. So, the doing proper research. It, it sounds like they just did a surface level, which is actually more than most digital marketing sure. agencies are going to do. A lot of them do guesswork, right? Do you talk about how to do proper research in here? Well, it's not. It's not hard. Yeah, it, it is literally. I mean, if I were to do this for a corporate or for a company that hired us, I would literally sit down with their team and spend a day and try to understand their product and their customer. Again, it's not, I say the product, I need to understand the product, but it is about the customer first. I mean, the thing I would tell you this more different than anything we do is just like a voter, I care about the customer. I really don't care about the owner or the company or the product. I need to understand it, but my all my emphasis on is the customer. And so I would sit down and try to understand where they've had success as a business and then is there room for expansion and what those customers look like? And then we would do the research and go out and try to figure out what, what that is. And I mean, we work with, uh, we have partnerships with lots of research firms that help us and work with us on that. And then we use that data. And then once we have that data, we start doing our small testing plans. But you'll be, in, you know, it's all, on the other side of this, you have a lot of businesses that just want, uh, how do I get rich quick pill? I don't, I don't research. No, 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 no. Just give me the ad that's going to make me the 10 X ROI on my product. And this is, again, is where we walk away because we have to be in alignment. Look, I'm looking to grow with that business. I'm not looking to make a quick buck on that business. And in order to do it, you have to do the proper, proper steps. Right. Let's talk about getting negative. Oh yeah. What do you what do you mean by getting negative? What is- <laughs> so you hear this and e- listen. Every single person that's listening to this will say the same thing. I hate negative cam- political campaign ads. I hate them. I hate them. Take them off the air. If I see one more political campaign ad that's negative, I'm not. You know, dot dot dot. Right. Right. And as a political media ad maker, I would tell you you know, basically fuck off because it works. We wouldn't do it if it didn't work. Yeah. And it is the most effective way to run a political campaign. In fact, you've probably even seen this. You've seen a a candidate for office or a politician stand up on the microphone and say, I will not run negative ads in this campaign. I will stay positive. <laughs> and you're like, that person just lost. I said, that guy's a dead man. Yeah. Or that woman's a dead woman. I mean, like it is like, if you want to commit suicide, go, go do something like that in politics. So 
I've decided I was going to introduce the the concept in the book of negative ad campaigns to businesses, but it's not what you think. It's not club them over the head like we do in politics. While that's fun in politics, that's suicide for businesses. So that's not what I'm saying. But there is a way to take the negative ad concept and use it in a comparative fashion to have effective to run an effective campaign for businesses. And I lay out a couple of examples in the book, but I'll I'll give you a couple that aren't in the book. There was McDonald's in, it may have been like in November, put a tweet up and they made a mistake. And in the tweet, literally the tweet said, insert copy here. Like the the person that was running the tweet, like, you know, just didn't realize what they did. And they posted a tweet that said, insert copy here. Well, Wendy's saw this and nice. and responded with McDonald's your tweets are broken like your ice cream machine that's going negative but by the way do you think negative about do you have any negative connotations on Wendy's no no it's funny yeah it it puts McDonald's down by the way McDonald's is the king I always say it's better to, to use this concept when you're the underdog swing up you're punching up yeah. and if you're McDonald's and you're punching down that could be a problem yeah but There are, and by the way, that tweet generated millions of social media hits. It generated probably hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of free advertising for Wendy's. And everybody laughed at it. Everybody. It was fun. It was smart. And I encourage businesses to do these types of things. The best example I think of all time is Steve Jobs. And he, Apple versus Mac. The Apple versus or, the Mac. Uh, Apple versus PC. Uh, yeah, I mean. Apple versus yeah. the PC ad. Mac versus PC. And you had the, the nerdy PC guy and the really hipster cool Mac guy. <laughs> right. You never saw in those ads anytime the Mac guy say anything negative about the the PC guy. It was always the PC guy stumbling over himself, doing something dumb, being nerdy, you know, and, uh, and it was it was even rare for the Mac guy to talk about himself. Right. Right. So he was always trying to help was the on guy. The PC, right. right. But here's the cool thing about it. That's not I, mean, I understand that's a cool that's a good example. But in researching that concept, because it just it stuck with me for 10 years now, I found out that Steve Jobs had made over 360 ads like the, the, the Mac versus the PC guy. They made 360 plus ads. He only ran about 60. So this was, he understood this concept. And then what he did was he took the best ones, the ones that were the least offensive, the ones that matched sort of the principles he was going by. And that, those are the ones that ran. So he really believed in the concept. Now, if you're going to argue with jobs, that's, that's fine. That's on you. But my thing is, is like, he didn't do this half ass. He didn't just put up a tweet like that. MF ran millions of dollars of ads. He ran it simultaneously to the iPhone coming out. And you can attribute all of those things, the iPhone, the iPad, but the Mac ads were part of that incredible surge that Apple took off after the iPhone came out. Because it, again, in a way, it branded everything that Mac was doing as cool, young, hip, that's what you know. You wanted to buy. You wanted to have that, and and Mac sales did go up after that ad campaign by a lot. But overall, it was the it was in the other big campaign that was done in a negative fashion. And I talk about it in the book. We don't have to get into the details, but it was the Pepsi versus the, the Pepsi challenge from the eighties. You're you're too young to remember this. Oh, I remember. The, the, there was the Pepsi challenge, and it was done in the eighties, and it spurred the biggest mistake in all of corporate history by by Coca Cola. They new Coca Cola. Yeah, right? they created yeah. new Coke, which was the biggest backlash. And and that's what I say. Like, and, and they're like these stages of grief. If you run, this is great. If you run a negative ad, or you know, do it in a smart, comparative way, your competition is going to go through stages of grief. The first stage is they're going to go, "Why is my competition doing that?" Oh, okay. Then they're going to put their heads in the sand, like we talked about earlier, because they're like, "Uh, I don't like that this guy is doing, you know, this company is doing this to me," and they'll kind of put their heads there. And then they'll come to this conclusion, like, "Wait a second." They're, they're hammering us right now. What are we doing? And then, then they're going they to scramble to try to adjust to it. And the smart marketers are already on to the next ad. Right. While this guy, uh, this company is trying to play defense. And in, in politics, our entire 
everything we work for is to be on offense. Like, do we, are we on defense? Of course we're on defense sometimes, but we got to be on offense more than we're on defense. And I'm like taking that to the corporate marketing front because I want my businesses to always be on offense. And then by the time this business finally responds, they do it in such a horrific way because they don't understand this principle, this concept, this strategy that they like Coke, Coke comes out with new Coke and it was the biggest disaster in the company's history. It almost bankrupt the entire company. This isn't a small business. This is Coca-Cola. And they almost were bankrupt over and over Pepsi, literally taking their market share away from them, which was the young, young people were starting to drink Pepsi at a much higher clip than Coke. And so they freaked out so much over it that they created new Coke and it almost bankrupt the whole company. Hmm. So this is awesome information. What I'm what I'm wondering about is if these are such powerful examples and and this works, why don't we see more of it in the corporate realm? We live in a very politically correct world. And I think true. I understand like from my world and what I do, I, I was, this was another realization like, oh, they don't do it. it this is so obvious. Yeah. And this is one of the lies in the book. A lot of marketers, digital marketers out there tell their clients, don't rock the boat. Don't put yourself out there. Put generic content out. So they can check the box and tell the client, look, we put, sorry, I'll, I'll do another great example. I mean, they'll, they'll put out, you know, national, like Delta Airlines put out National Hispanic, Hispanic Heritage Appreciation Month. <sighs> and and I, I told this story on, on TV the other day and, and the uh, interviewer was like, what's wrong with that? <laughs> and I go, look. There's nothing wrong with that concept. Right. But it is such blatant, generic, gobbledygook pandering that it doesn't do anything. Here's what Delta did. They said, Delta Airlines, let's check a box. Let's make the sure the Hispanic community is happy with us. No Hispanic gives a damn about Hispanic Heritage Appreciation Month. Here's what they should have done. Here's what their marketing company should have recommended. And here is what is a 10X on that concept. Identify three Hispanics in Delta Airlines who have an incredible story of coming into this country, earning their way in, coming to the company, working from a small job to a senior level management role, Highlight their family, their story, their people love to buy into great stories. And I'm sure that there are Hispanics at Delta Airlines who have unbelievable stories. And every that should have been for that month that Delta did that, they could have highlighted stories. It could have done two things. Look, they could have put them on the screens of their TV where you sit in your your seat on Delta Airlines. Read you know this family story that it works in our company. One, no everybody, everybody that read that story, it would brand that company as someone is Delta Airlines, man, they they have an incredible company, they care about their employees. You know, all those good PR aspects that every business wants. But on the other side, think of what it would have done internally at that company to highlight an employee instead of some generic gobbledygook crap, like let's just generically celebrate everyone. Yeah. Like it doesn't do anything. It's all crap. And so what I try to do is get businesses to not put out crap <laughs> and generic <laughs> crap and gobbledygook that most marketers will tell the companies to do. And then at the end of the month, the, the digital marketer sends a report that says, we put out 12 press releases this month. They didn't do anything, but guess what? We stayed busy, pay us our check. And the company does it because they go, oh, the marketing firm's been busy. I'm not interested in that. Yeah. And that's where I see that, you know, basically I, I see this a lot. You know, this is, this is a breath of fresh air. And I can see now what you were saying at the beginning of the mentality you 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 had empathy for this fearful mentality of these companies right because they're at the end of the day they feel risk averse and they'll they'll just take what's given to them by these marketing agencies but what you're describing is an empowering mindset in in making you feel almost like a bull in a china shop right you have all these timid competitors you have all these timid companies who are hesitant to make moves like this with their marketing. And they're some of the most effective marketing strategies you can employ. Look, we'll go back to this one thing, and I, and I can't emphasize it enough. Every single business 
in our entire country and world will be disrupted in the next 10 years. And if you're a business owner and you've got your head in the sand over it and you want to put out generic crap and you don't want to use outlier strategies and you don't want to push your business to the next level, then you're going to find yourself in a very difficult position very soon. The world is just changing. It is changing faster than when we've ever thought. And you've got to stay, you've got to grow, you've got to pro- be proactive, and you can't live in the fear of what's coming. You've got to embrace the change, just like I did with my own disease. And that's why I'm so passionate about this. Yeah. So Phil, tell me, what is the impact you're hoping this book mm-hmm. is going to make? Let's look look down into those one, five, 10 year marks. What are you hoping companies will do with this? How will it change how we market? Had I not changed, had I not had the disease that I have, I freely admit I would probably be divorced one day. My business would have gone out of business, probably would have severely impacted my child for the rest of her life by a broken marriage. And it was based in not trying to grow, not trying to be better, not in living in fear. And I is selfishly, I am living an extraordinary life right now. I feel an abundance of love, vulnerability. Um, I feel I'm vulnerable for the first time in my life. I have empathy for the first time in my life. And I want to help other people get out of that state. I understand how it feels. I've lived it. It sucks. And even if you don't live it in every aspect of your life, if I can just help businesses get out of that and it helps and propels people into better places, that is the impact I want to have. That's a great, great place to be. And the book is Fire Them Now. philipstutz.com slash audit is where they can go to yeah, get the free audit. For your listeners, yeah. we've discounted the Kindle ebook. It's at $9.99 originally. We, we just uh, reduced it to $6.99. Uh, we'll leave it up for a couple days after the podcast goes out. So if you want to get it on Kindle, $6.99. Excellent. And how can our listeners follow you and potentially connect with you apart from the audit sure. if they just want to thank you for the podcast? It, it's all in the book. Literally, my Facebook page, my Twitter, my email is in the book. Everything's in the book, but uh, the Twitter is at Philip Stutz, just my name. And my Facebook page is, uh, I believe, CEO Philip Stutz. So those are two places you can find me. Excellent. Thanks for being on the show, Phil. Yeah, thank you. Many thanks to Philip Stutz for being on the show. You can buy his book, Fire Them Now, on Amazon.com. Thanks again for listening to Author Hour, enlightening conversations about books with the author.